Obviously and hopefully you know that he serves as president of Dallas Theological Seminary and senior professor of Bible exposition. His love for people and passion for the truth provide a unique leadership perspective for both the church and the classroom. He and his wife, Barbie, who is also speaking on campus today, have been married for over 40 years. They have two sons, Joshua and his wife, Emily, and Jeremy and his wife, Callie, and five grandchildren. So would you please join me in welcoming our president, Dr. Mark Bailey. Well, good morning. <laughs> this message has uh, uh, evolved, or devolved, I should say, uh, as I thought about opening chapel, and as I thought about our world, and I thought about uh, uh, the gospel and the person of Christ. Uh, uh, over the last number of months, I have been uh, uh, increasingly interested in uh, studying how Jesus identified himself, how he uh, thought about his ministry, and in uh, the different gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at each point at the beginning of his ministry, as those men were led by the Spirit of God to write their account of the life and teachings of Christ, uh, the opening message of Jesus in each is unique and uh, pregnant with meaning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I, I want to talk about the good news of Jesus. And in Mark 1, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, after Jesus has been authenticated by his uh, baptism and his temptation, introduced by John the Baptist, it says, now after G John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. I thought about and I had studied and prepped to uh, take each of those phrases one by one and as I got into them, uh, they are uh, loaded with implication, every single one of them. Uh, and so what I thought I would do is take the first one, summarize the other four, and then uh, show you the relevance of why you're at seminary and why we have a value at Dallas Seminary uh, in our uh, ex ex exegetical and expositional courses of uh, a priority of the original languages and uh, the value that they have. So if you haven't taken Greek, uh, you should. Uh, if you are taking Greek, be encouraged. If you've never thought about taking Greek, think about it. But uh, I think it's going to be fun just to uh, unlock uh, a key, uh, to unlock a part of Mark's gospel. Uh, when you look at that opening message, uh, it talks about a point in time. The arrest of John and Jesus coming into Galilee. It talks about Jesus proclaiming the gospel. Uh, he is the preacher of the gospel. He is the messenger and the message of his own gospel. It is the fulfillment of prophecy. The time is fulfilled. Uh, the central message, the referent of almost all of the parables, uh, the uh, opening message, the kingdom of God is at hand, or in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Acts, they were wondering about the kingdom in Acts chapter 1. Paul is still talking about it in Acts 28. It is a theme of the ministry of Jesus. And, of course, the imperatives, repent and believe the gospel. So at a point in time, the Messiah came with his message in fulfillment of prophetic expectation with the promise of the kingdom that, as you know, reverses the whole issue of the fall in human history that leads you all the way to the consummation revelation. And in light of that message, there comes the demand of a personal response. Repent and believe the gospel. In that passage... It says, now after John was arrested, the Greek word is paradidomi. Paradidomi. Uh, it's a unique term in Mark's gospel. It's found 19 times. And so I just want to leaf through the pages of Mark, and I want to show you where this term occurs and why it's so significant to the key of the gospel of Mark. In Mark 3.19, Judas Iscariot, who, there's that word again, betrayed him. It was used of uh, being delivered in uh, arresting when John the Baptist was uh, uh, hauled in by Herod uh, for having pointed his finger at him and saying, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So John is arrested, and that turns the corner from John to Jesus in the ministry of the forerunner to the Messiah. But you get an advanced teaching early on in the gospel 
because Mark wants you to know, as the Spirit of God guides him, God wants you to know through Mark that Judas is going to uh, betray Jesus. He will deliver him up, deliver him over. Same word, same word. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 31, he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. That'll be partly by Judas and partly by others. They will kill him, and when he is killed after three days, he will rise. So John the Baptist is delivered. A Jesus is delivered. He's betrayed by one of his own. In Mark chapter 10, that gets repeated. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priest to the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him, same word over, to the Gentiles. It happens by Judas. It happens by the religious leaders. It happens by the Gentiles. In Mark 13, 9, in the Olivet Discourse, he advances the history down into the time of the tribulation. And he says, uh, if you were alive and you're going through that, uh, and you are an identifier with Jesus Christ, be on your guard for they'll deliver you. Same word, paradidomy, to councils. You'll be beaten in synagogues. Don't miss that, a future time in human history where there will be Jewish persecution in the land of Israel again. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Mark 13, 11, they will bring you to trial and deliver you over. Same word. Don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need to study and go to seminary. What it means is under duress, at a critical point, when you're put on the spot to stand for Christ, God's going to give you the ability to keep and be uh, that faithful witness at that point in time. In Mark 13, 12, brother will deliver brother over to death. It's going to be such a, a phenomenal time. Jewish persecution, political persecution, even family betrayal. A father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. In Mark 14, 11, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. In Mark chapter 14, 11, when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity. There it is again, betray. 17 out of 19 times, it relates to this concept of uh, being delivered over to religious or political persecution, to be betrayed by one's friend, to be betrayed by one's family, the opportunity to betray. 14, 18, as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said to them, truly I say, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Mark 14, 21, for the Son of Man goes that is, that is written of him. Don't miss this. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Should have underlined that word there. It has, would have been better for that man had he not been born. In the providence of God, Jesus was God's man for the hour as the counsel of heaven as well as the consequence of human sinfulness. Ravi Zacharias has been so helpful to me that the most, the worst moment in human history, when the most innocent was uh, persecuted uh, the worst, was the greatest moment in history when God was at his best. It answers the ultimate question, if God is God and God is a God of love and God is a God of power, then how comes evil into this world, as Epicurus asked. And the answer is, by the sovereign, design of God, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. God was at his best in that moment of the crucifixion, and humanity was at its worst. God had to be at his best, if I could say it that way, so that he could deliver man from his worst. The cross becomes the greatest display of sinfulness and the greatest display of grace, all in a moment, all according as it was written about him. There is divine sovereignty, but there is absolute responsibility. It would have been better for that man had he not been born because of the consequences of that kind of sin. 1442, rise, let us be going. My betrayer, or the one who is betraying me, is at hand. And Mark 14, 44, now the betrayer has given them a sign, saying, the one I kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. 
In 15.1, as, as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And what we have later, in 15.10, Pilate says he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. Notice the betrayal, notice the motivation, notice the horrendous consequences. What I learned from those five statements in the context of Mark's gospel, here's a statement that I put together. Thus, the gospel is rooted, the good news, is rooted in the historical person and message of Jesus Christ, who has come in fulfillment of prophetic expectation with the announcement of the imminent and inevitable arrival of the kingdom of God, which invites, yea, even demands, the appropriate response of repentant faith, even in the context of cultural hostility. Now think about it, if John endured that, and if Jesus endured that, and his disciples would endure that, and future disciples in the tribulation would endure that, then the message of Mark to you and I is that the gospel comes with a powerful message of good news to a bad world. The gospel comes centered in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It will be through that gospel work of Jesus Christ that God's kingdom will one day come, as Revelation says, then the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The gospel comes in a context of cultural hostility. We're watching hostile betrayals. We're watching a world in conflict. We're watching political intrigue. We're watching uh, electronic sabotage. Uh, we're, we're, we're watching uh, political banter, in fact, verbal warfare. A context of hostility isn't new to the presentation of the gospel. When Rome was tyrannical and taxes were outrageous and slavery was uh, phenomenally brutal, and in the context of Mark's gospel, when the Romans and the Jewish leaders were persecuting Christians, the linkage between John and Jesus, his disciples, and all future disciples, and in the death of Jesus Christ himself, paradidomi becomes a key word that would be a warning, it would be a dose of reality, but it also would be an incredible encouragement. When I think about that, that's not a different message than what Paul preached. Listen to what he said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks. What's the core of the message again? Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. When you see that message, the purpose of Mark's gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mark selected events from the life and ministry of Jesus Christ to present the gospel to a Roman readership by proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and to provide a pattern of discipleship. What does it mean to follow Christ? Who uh, was introduced by John, who was betrayed was preached by Jesus, and the same word for preaching throughout this context of John, Jesus, and the disciples is the same word in our seminary motto, Karuxon Tan Lagan. It's the announcement of that message of good news. It's a pattern of discipleship. How do you live in spite of the hospitality of the culture? While you serve Jesus Christ, even if necessary, to the point of death. Some of you who come from uh, other nations are going to need to be our instructors in these days. Uh, you know what it's like to come from a culture in which Christianity was never a dominant thought. It was never a majority opinion. It was a minority view, just like it was in the beginning. We, we need to hear from you. We need to pay attention to you. We're watching our culture in the United States make a drastic turn away from Christ where Christianity that was once respected and then tolerated has now become the object of scorn. What is it going to mean for us to live and preach the gospel 
when uh, the experience of paradidomy, betrayal, delivered over, delivered up for money, for envy, for political correctness, all of the reasons modeled in Mark's gospel no longer simply become a historical message to Mark's early audience. It becomes a phenomenal message to us today. Just a word study to let you know Mark puts in that key and turns the lock. I could have used another word for arrest, he says, but I'm going to use this word, and I'm going to use it all the way through my gospel to link Jesus, John, the disciples, all future disciples, even after the time of the church. What relevance, then, does it have for us who find ourselves in the in-between time? Let's pray. Father, just a few thoughts from a great little book with a big message. Thank you for Jesus who summarized so succinctly his mission and message and the implication that there's going to be a need to realign ourselves with God, to change the way we think about our world and ourselves so that we can think like God thinks about life and to trust, to believe the good news of the gospel that you have provided in Christ all that's necessary for our salvation, both for time and eternity. Would you help us grasp in a little bit more measure the significance of thoughts linking the arrest of John, the location in Galilee of the Gentiles, to a Messiah who has a message that comes in fulfillment of great expectation that will ultimately result in the answer to the prayer he asked us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we be thinking rightly and trusting rightly. And we're convicted by the fact that those are present imperatives and not aorist imperatives. It's a constant state of denying ourselves in relationship to you, our Father, and it's a constant expression of our trust. That's what you've asked us. May we respond like you've asked us to respond, and may we help others do the same, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good day.